Welcome to Spinning Back Click, where each week here at MMA Junkie, we take a spin through the biggest headlines in the sport. This week, I'm joined by Mike Bond, Danny Segura, and gorgeous George Garcia. So let's just jump right into it, guys. The USC is set to kick off the promotion's 2022 schedule with a stellar main event this weekend between Calvin Cater and Giga Chikadze on ESPN before it shifts to pay-per-view for next week's US two, USC 270, I should say, which is going to come with a price tag. I got choked up there because it's going to come with a price tag of $74.99, a new high for the promotion. Now, it is worth noting, of course, up front that this is not a USC decision. It's an ESPN decision. But the question I'll ask is, is it a bad decision? Is there a potential to have a negative impact on fan interest in the sport with this cost increase in pay-per-views? Let's put four minutes on the clock. Mike, get us started. Look, the reality is uh, price, raise, price raises and pretty much anything in the world right now are commonplace. But I think the thing that rubbed people the wrong way is kind of a multi-layered thing here. They just did one not that long ago. It went from $59.99 to $64.99. So I think that bothered some people. And um, on top of that, you know, there's no clear indication where this money is going. If someone had, you know, the UFC or ESPN had come out and said, hey, we're raising it by this much and this is going towards fighter pay or going towards this or the other thing. I think fans would be very, very happy to pay for that, knowing directly where it's going. But from all indications, this is just, uh, you know, the UFC and ESPN probably feel the product is extremely hot right now and that they can pull a little bit more out of their fan base. Um, I understand why I would try it. And for me personally, it's not, you know, it doesn't affect me too much because as you know, reporters were either on site for these pay-per-views covering them in person or we get to expense them through work, things like that. So it's not like it's hitting me hard in the pocket, but I think it's just another one of those things that drives the fan base away a little bit or rubs them in the wrong way and causes them to maybe if, you know, they're a person that's on the verge of wanting to pirate events or something like that maybe this is what puts them over the edge yes in the grand scheme it's only five dollars but when you're talking about it being that amount of money you know that five dollars is a little more than if you're going for five to ten dollars so um yeah i don't think this was the best timing for it if you're kind of reading the room in terms of where we are you know in the world but uh, it's something they did and i think there's going to be you know for their pocket positive consequences maybe for the fans negative ones what an interesting PR move that would have been, right? To say we're raising it by five dollars, but this is all going directly to the fighters' pockets. We assure you, that'd be interesting. Danny, what do you think? Could this possibly have a negative impact? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely not a good look, just from the fact that one, you're paying a little bit more. Again, it's not a whole lot, but still, not so long ago they had uh, raised the prices, so that does sting a little bit. And look, it's expensive to be an MMA fan and just a combat sports fan in general. It's, it's always been. But it just keeps getting more and more expensive. I mean, if you're taking in account like what, 12 pay-per-views a year now uh, with the increased price, plus you pay ESPN plus to catch all your UFC fight uh, fight nights. I mean, you're almost at a thousand dollars a year. And that's just to be a UFC uh, fan. Right. If you consider the streaming service that uh, Bellator is on with Showtime, you know, Fight Pass, um, if you start watching some other stuff. Uh, in combat sports such as boxing etc i mean you're gonna break over a thousand dollars and yes maybe you can go to a friend's house split it with a couple people go to a bar etc but it's still expensive to be an mma fan and uh that's definitely not a good thing and it's also coming off uh the the most successful or you know at least self-proclaimed most successful year of the company's history obviously dana white has been you know made a lot of comments on, on the media about that about how much money they made how much success they found so it's like if you've had so much financial success this year why do you need to hike up the price and again i know it's an espn decision but it's expensive and look i'm a football fan or soccer how you say in the states and all i have to do to watch la liga is pay espn plus monthly and that's it there's no pay-per-views there's nothing else and uh, if I want to watch Premiere, then, you know, I pay Fuo TV or other streaming services, but are much, much cheaper. So it is extremely expensive to be a combat sports fan. And um, I know it's just five dollars, but it can't be uh, an attractive thing for new fans. You know, you show somebody a pay-per-view and you're like, hey, you want to you want to check this out? You want to split this? And you're like, what? I got to drop, you know, 40 bucks for this. You know, it's it's tough. So um, definitely not 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 something good, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, if there's one thing we can say, there's no question it's expensive to be an MMA fan, right? Especially if you're looking at things outside the UFC. This isn't going to help, that's for sure. Nobody's going to buy it just because the price went up. But I'll be honest with you, I don't think it's going to hurt that much. If it's your thing, it's your thing. And $5 isn't going to change anything. The prices of everything are going up. Sports rights fees are insane right now. I just think it's the reality of the landscape right now. It's not a great thing, 
but I don't think it's going to hurt the UFC. But guys, speaking of the UFC, a lightweight title holder Charles Oliveira saying he'd love a chance to become a champ champ, though that doesn't necessarily seem to be in the cards right now with Justin Gaethje just itching for that title shot, and that man's going to riot if you don't give it to him, so let's go ahead and do that. But let's take a look at the list of UFC champs right now. Is there one that you feel is most deserving of a champ champ opportunity or maybe just one that you might like to see for your own entertainment? Let's put four minutes on the clock, Danny, get us going. Man, Charles Oliveira is on fire right now. He wants red panty night against Conor McGregor. Now talking about being a, a champ champ. I mean, uh, he, he definitely has a lot to say. Uh, but I'd say this, as far as the champ champ things, I've, I've been for them. I enjoy them. I like them, but under the right circumstances. I don't like this trend where, you know, you win the belt and all of a sudden, you know, you want a second one and you want to, you know, ignore what's happening in the division and just go up a weight class or drop one and uh, fight for another title. I don't I don't like that. I think champ champ fights should come at very special moments when, when you got champions that are extremely, extremely dominant. And uh, there's nothing else. There's nothing else for them to do in their, in their division. They've cleared it out. And I actually think a champ champ fight serves its purpose because, you know, you can go fight another champion and it gives the, the division time to grow a little bit for contenders to surge to come up. So I think in that scenario, the best weight class that you can apply a champ champ fight has got to be in the women's division at 125 pounds. No doubt, Valentina Shevchenko is the dominant force and by miles. So in my opinion, Valentina Shevchenko is prime for a, a uh, champ champ fight. Obviously, she's fought before at 135 pounds. I don't think 115 is an option for her. Uh, to many people's eyes, she won a title at 135 when she fought Amanda Nunes a, a few years back. So why not try that? I know there's a little bit of uh, things up in the air with Nunes and Peña, but at some point, I think Valentina Shevchenko should try to become Chan champ by going up to 135 pounds. Yeah, it's hard to argue against her. I mean, with what she's accomplished already and what she seems primed to still do. George, what about you? Is there a name that stands out to you? I went through the same processes as Danny. You look at all the champions that are out there, and what you want to look for is for someone that's cleaned out their division. In the males, you get to Kamaru Usman. He's probably the first one where you can go, okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a stacked division, but he's kind of gone through a lot of names. But is he going to challenge Israel Adesanya? I mean, they've talked about that brotherhood they have, the African fighters. It, it just doesn't seem to me like them two are going to get down. Um, then you look at Israel Adesanya, who's kind of cleaned out his division, but he just had his attempt. So you have to shut it down. And so what do we do? We arrive back at what Danny says, and that's Valentina Shashenko. Although I'd like to eat, leave her one more option, and that's if somehow Nunez and Pena doesn't get done, which would be ridiculous to me. I think they got to basically run that back. And let's just say Pena did take on another opponent for whatever reason. I wouldn't even mind watching Valentina compete at 145. All she has to do is weigh 136 and a half, and she's technically a featherweight. And we'd get to see uh, Nunez versus Shevchenko 3, I I'll albeit in another capacity, another weight class, but I'll still watch it. And then if she wins all three belts, she's triple C. And that opens up the intergender championship that we've all been waiting for, right? It's, 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 uh, the seed was planted, guys. The seed was there. Mike, what about you? Anything else? No, I think they hit it pretty close. Kamaru Usman's done spectacular work as welterweight champion. He's lapping the competition. Valentina Shevchenko, the same in her division. But I'm honestly not that keen on having any champ champ fights in the near future. Nothing screams to me that it makes sense. Um, and it's fun in the moment. It's cool if the person wins, they get those two belts, they get all the fancy photos and stuff. But can we name a scenario where it's gone really great after the fact when we move forward into that champ champ reign? I mean, I know Amanda Nunes had her own thing, but that was like, you know, one of those divisions is so barren and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I think for like the sanctity of the sport for these divisions, the structure, the health and all that, I think just keeping people in their own lane is the best move. Yeah, I'm going to agree with you there. I mean, I, I, the championship thing is great, but I think we rush to it a little bit too fast sometimes. And as you said, it hasn't necessarily played out the best in all these scenarios. I will say if anybody is most deserving, I got to agree with you guys. It's Valentina Shevchenko. Even if it was right now against Juliana Pena, then that might open up the need for the Amanda Nunes trilogy that Dana White sometimes says he doesn't need to see. And I think a lot of fans want to. I'll just throw out one quick name for my own personal edification. How about Glover Teixeira going up? What a way that would be to end a career, right? Goes up, champ, champ, I'm out. What a career, I'm done. Does he deserve it? Ah, but it sure would be fun. So maybe it'll happen. <laughs> While we're doing a little fantasy matchmaking, let's do a little fantasy rule making as well. Francis Nagano and Tyson Fury going back and forth in the media. While it's fun to imagine how it might play out, let's be honest. I mean, Fury would have a major edge in a traditional boxing match. Well, Nagano, I got to think, would likely be favored in an MMA fight, even if he's not what you think of necessarily as a fantastic grappler. But if you were tasked with putting this fight together, 
What tweaks are you making to keep this thing competitive, keep the interest high, keep it intriguing? George, you get it started. Four minutes on the clock. Yeah, and here's the thing. You know, Nganu has a boxing background nowhere near and as extensive as uh, and decorated as Tyson Fury, obviously. We get it. But he's not a complete fish out of water. He knows how to throw hands. He's got heavy hands. So there's a there's a great start to just using four ounce gloves. But we're still talking about a more technical lifelong boxer versus a less technical, uh, not you know who, who a boxer who hasn't put in as much time in the sport. Don't want to in any way disrespect Big Fran over at Extreme Couture, um, but we have to even things out a little bit because I'm telling you, man. You know every time. I, I take these hard. Every time we have to scrape up that MMA body off the boxing canvas, it just pisses me off because you know we would take their lunch money in a real fight anywhere else, on the schoolyard, at the club, at the bar, wherever. It's over. But instead, we do go over there. Their money's better. I get it. But it just hasn't gone well for the guys. So to even things out, what we need is we need elbows. And, you know, That's it. We just need elbows. It's obvious that it's standing only, right? Because it's boxing. I don't need to say on the ground. But uh, yeah, we 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 had elbows. Sure, maybe I I thought about this. Maybe um, if they didn't want to do elbows, kicks from the from the uh, from the waist and below, perhaps. But I I don't know at that point. I don't know that. I I think we we need to use you know the arms and the hands and at least the elbows part of the arm. Um, Plus, Tyson Fury would probably want to go above the waist. I think he'd have a nice front kick, man. He's he's like six nine. So I imagine that's probably the only kick he'd be interested in throwing. Elbows and kicks would certainly be game changers. Mike, what about you? What would you like to see in a little tweak here? I don't think we need the elbows and kicks or anything like that. I think doing punches only is fine. I mean, Francis Ngannou isn't much of a kicker regardless. So it's not like, you know, we're taking away a huge weapon of his. He's a puncher and he's got ridiculous knockout power. So I think to evil, even the playing field on the striking side, I like Tyson Fury's original idea, doing a boxing match with MMA gloves. Uh, it makes it a much more interesting dynamic because obviously, you know, boxing gloves are much bigger than the MMA gloves. So defense changes, you know, could Francis and Gano, yes, maybe he's not the same type of technical skilled striker when it comes to boxing as Tyson Fury. But if he can get one of those punches through the guard, it's a complete game changer there too. So I think that's the way to kind of balance it from both worlds. You're giving them both the situation where they're punching, where they're most comfortable, but you're putting Francis Ngannou in MMA gloves where he would obviously have the the more comfort, the advantage, no kind of the angles, the speed, things like that. So I think that's the way to go, the best way to meet in the middle if you're going to do some sort of modified rules and not just a straight up box match yeah i mean even that might be enough to sway things a little bit maybe some some clinch work a la triad combat i don't know danny yeah. danny what do you think should, should be done no to, to be all serious and and I, I don't like the modifications and look respect to try to combat respect to all the people that enjoy it all power to you but i'm not of changing the rules because then you what i want to watch in combat sports is is who is the best and I don't want to find out who's the best with this modification and this here and there and then, you know, this other thing uh, changed. I want to find out who's the best. Pretty simple in MMA or boxing. I want boxers to cross over to MMA, see how that goes. I think we all have a pretty clear idea of how it would go. MMA fighters to cross over to the boxing right when it lends itself. So, look, if Francis Ngannou wants to fight Tyson Fury and this fight is going to happen, make it in the boxing ring under boxing rules. And look. Maybe use a little bit of smaller gloves. You can do that in boxing. Uh, But all in all, I like to keep it uniform. I like to keep the same because I want to know what the result means. And by keeping the same rules, we sort of have that standard. So, again, if Francis Ngannou wants to cross over to the boxing world, do it. I saw Anderson Silva kick ass and and beat a former world champion. Make whatever you want of Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., but I saw it. So, uh, it's it's not too grim for, for all MMA fighters. You know, Dan, you said one thing that's so interesting there is like just knowing what it means. When you do these crossovers, you don't really know what the result means. But I will say in this one, it's crazy enough out there that I I might be open to something. And let me just throw one out there. How about bare knuckle? And let me say the reason. Then you go those two-minute rounds, a little bit less rounds. Give Big Fran a couple more minutes to uh, catch his breath in between salvos. (laughs) Might make it kind of interesting, guys. All right, well, guys, we will be streaming Wednesday's Invicta 45 event on MMA Junkie, which is a first for the leading all-women's MMA promotion. So we're excited about that here at MMA Junkie, of course. So to celebrate the occasion, let's look to the history books. And I want to ask you, in your mind, which former Invicta FC fighter do you think best represents the talent that the promotion has developed over the years? Let's put four minutes on the clock. Mike, get us going. 
Carlos Esparza really stands out to me. I mean, I know maybe there's some bigger names, sexier names, things like that. But I think Carla obviously fought, I think, on the second ever Invicta card of Invicta FC2. Uh, she was a big part of some of their early narratives in terms of, you know, the, the straw weights. She had that big rivalry with Claudia Gadelia, and it never materialized into a fight in Invicta. I think they had two canceled matchups, and that finally happened years later in the UFC, not for a title or anything. But... Um, yeah, I think Carla is someone, obviously, you know, she was the number one seed, I believe, in that Ultimate Fighter tournament when they ended up kind of poaching that strawweight division and bringing it over for the inaugural belt. Of course, she won the tournament as well and became the inaugural UFC champion. So when I think of kind of Invicta and someone, from, especially those early days that really personified um, that organization and carried their success through. And maybe if you didn't know Carla Esparza too well, you went back and watched her Invicta fights through the Ultimate Fighter, things like that. And she was someone that really stood out. So look at her today. She's about to fight for that title again against Rose Namajunas, another you know person that was in that division that she faced off in the Ultimate Fighter final. So um, yeah, I think Carla Esparza has really carried that torch well for that organization and represented them very well, even you know eight years later fighting in the UFC. Yeah, it's a great shout. Inaugural UFC champ at Strawweight, but also inaugural champion and Victor as well at Strawweight. So a great one there. Danny, how about you? I'm going to do change the rules a little bit here, John. I'm, I'm not going to name a specific fighter, but a specific division. I think Invicta's contribution to women's MMA has been huge, has been enormous. But if you have to narrow things down, you have to talk about 115 pounds. I mean, the UFC had 135, obviously, um, you know, prior to, to bringing uh, that new division over. But 115 for so long, and, and it's the same thing almost as WEC for 135 and 145 that was the best that was the best organization period the best division in the history of the sport at that time um at 115 pounds and obviously the ufc carries that over and and 115 today in my opinion is the best division uh, in mixed martial arts for the women and invicta fc is has a huge role and it's been responsible for that i mean you just mentioned the names right carlos Sparza, rose namayunis uh tisha torres angela hill alexa grasso felice herrig and the list goes on. There's so many, so many uh, very talented female fighters that competed in, in Invicta. And Invicta really just created a fantastic weight class. And even years after uh, that sort of uh, original crop, we see uh, the benefits, you know, in other organizations as the fighters have moved on. Yeah, you changed the rules there. But honestly, I can't argue with you on that, man. It'd be a shame not to recognize the contribution of basically launching that division all at one time. So, George, how about you? Any names to stand out? Well, Esparza was one, uh, definitely a great one, and Mike summed it up perfectly. Uh, what she did was incredible there. and um, But one that's kind of close to my heart, I guess, a little bit was, uh, John, you can relay. We called Aspen Lad at Tough Enough, and they had, a, they had a tournament where the winner would get an Invicta contract, and that's what happened to her. So her actual professional career started at Invicta, and she did very well there. The only problem was she didn't get to the point where she could possibly compete for a title because then the UFC came calling. So that one was pretty cool to be a, a part of, I guess, a little bit and watch it from its infancy. Um, and I know there's going to be, I, I watch these YouTube comments. There's a lot of people are like, hey, what about Nunez? What about Rose? And Okay, settle down. Um, Nunez and Rose did have runs at Invicta, but they weren't like successful because they both, I think, went two and one. But they're studs. They're killers. They're Mount Rushmore fighters, you know, in the WMMA world. Uh, Cyborg, however, went over there, won and defended three times. So you have to think about her. You have to think about Carla Sparza also winning that title. I think she did get a defense in there. Um, and then lastly, I got to give a shout out to Shayna Baszler. She was part of Invicta. She's an OG in the sport. Uh, but to kind of put all that behind her and then go and succeed over at WWE, becoming a tag team champ twice and an NXT champ, that's pretty amazing too. Invicta should be proud of her run. Yeah, you guys did a great job outlining. I mean, you talk about the big names, the Cyborgs, the Nunes, the Nami Yunus, you know, all UFC champions, you know, cut their teeth over there. That Cyborg, I guess it had some greatness everywhere, wherever she was. I mean, Marlis Kunin was there at one point. Jessica Penne was there. Liz Carmouche, Laura Sanko, even in different ways, both in and out of the cage. So uh, it's been great to see what his Invicta has done, and uh, we're happy to be carrying the event uh, on Wednesday. Guys, finally, I hope everyone enjoyed their holiday break away from major MMA events because the uh, 2022 schedule is officially underway uh, after a few slow weeks. Things are getting cranking back up again uh, this weekend. With this weekend alone, we've got a UFC, we've got one, we've got LFA, we've got KSW. They're all in action after a, a couple of slow weeks. So give me one name or one matchup that you're going to be going out of your way to watch this weekend and tell us why we should all do the same. Let's put four minutes on the clock. Danny, you can kick this one off. 
it's got to be that UFC main event. I mean, Giga Chikasi going against Calvin Cater, that's just a fantastic fight just right off the bat. Uh, a great treat for all the striking fans out there. Obviously, uh, Calvin with great boxing, great hands, but you got Giga with that uh, high-level kickboxing. So it's going to be a very interesting, contrasting styles. But uh, beyond just the technical, I think it's a huge, huge fight for 145 pounds. Right now, we saw that Max Holloway had to withdraw from the title fight against Alexander Volkanovsky. And all of a sudden, you got all these contenders racing their hand. But a lot of people have their eyes, including myself, on the matchup this Saturday because that could very well determine who the next challenger is at 145 pounds, especially if Giga picks up a victory since he's on a nice win streak. And uh, each time he's just been escalating uh, in levels of opponent. And I think this fight against Kadar is just that. So I'm really looking forward to this fight from all facets, from storylines, from the action itself, from the styles. I think it's just a fantastic matchup, in my opinion, the best fight of the weekend. Danny cashing in on the benefit of being in that leadoff position, taking that low-hanging fruit right there. George, what do you think? You got something a little, little further down the roster anywhere? Yeah, you got to look down in the prelims. It's, you know, a uh, Saturday afternoon fight, not a Saturday night fight. But I, I'm really interested in uh, Saeed Yakub Kakarmarov, excuse me, against Brian Kelleher. Both guys get after it. Both guys like to throw hands. But both guys are finishers in that they also go for the submission as well. So and that, and of course, I always talk about the Bantamweights and how much I love that division. So I'll definitely be keeping an eye on that one. We recently had Saeed Yacoub on MMA Junkie Radio, and he's excited. He knows how it works. He's kind of a nobody, but Kelleher's a name. So if he can get one over on Kelleher, that definitely will propel him upwards. Uh, and then, of course, got to give some love to Zapatella and Daboni. Wednesday night here on MMA Junkie, the main event. Split decision that it went to uh, the first time around. Um, and both of these ladies, you know, are, are you know angling to get at it. Had John, had you asked me, though, uh, what are you looking forward to in February? I'll tell you this much. It's when Manchester United eliminates Danny Segura's Atletico Madrid from the Champions League. <laughs> I didn't say it was fantasy stuff. I mean, come on, we're talking about things that might actually happen. But no, listen, you know, that's a funny <laughs> prelim that you laid out there. Saeed Yacouba, CFSC vet, Brian Keller, are always exciting. because so that's one that I actually have circled on my weekend sheet as well. Mike, how about you? What, what are you looking out for? What do we need to be watching? I mean, this is probably more of a selfish one, just as the uh, MMA media stats nerd here and stuff. But uh, I kind of have the Caitlin Chukagian fight, uh, the rematch with Jennifer Maya circled on my calendar, purely because Caitlin Chukagian is going for a somewhat dubious historical statistical achievement. And that would be if she wins this fight, her first 10 UFC wins would all be by the decision which has never happened before with a fighter. There's multiple who reach nine without a finish in the UFC. So she'd be the first to get 10. And uh, obviously that's a hugely important fight at 125 pounds too. I mean, if you go back to that UFC 244 card and picked any matchup on the lineup that would do a rematch, you probably would have been like, hey, Diaz versus Masvidal. I bet they'll run it back. You probably wouldn't have picked Chukagian versus Maya, but we know that the state of this division, Valentina Shevchenko has run through all the challengers. There's not too many people out there, so they kind of have to pair up some of these former title challengers against each other. I think it's a compelling fight. Obviously, see where these two stand. They want to get back to that rematch with Valentina. So uh, this is an important fight. And if Caitlin Chukagian can kind of avoid that dubious distinction and go out there and get her first UFC finish in this matchup on this platform, that would be a huge statement for her at 125 pounds. And then, of course, if Jennifer Maya can stop her and you know get that vengeance and get that win back, that would be big for her. So uh, in terms of like divisional layout outside the main event for the UFC card, this one has some pretty high stakes attached to it yeah listen i mean the ufc cards are always going to get the most attention i will say rosario bontarine versus brandon roy Vall kind of surprised no one threw that one out there that looks like a banger and with some real uh you know impact in the division as well but listen look around the globe one's got habib's latest protege in action but you should know kami is back in action at one championship this weekend looking for that ksw's got a couple of title fights over there as well so i'm telling you i'm just happy that we've got a busy weekend schedule it's been too long guys the holidays were fun but it's been too long there's going to be a ton of stuff happening this weekend and moving into the future, of course, we'll talk about it all on Spinning Backflip.